Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful Fourth of July weekend and you're ready to get back to it. So, uh, as usual, any questions, concerns, shoot them to the through the question box. Be happy to talk about them. Um, but I always have something to talk about. So we're going to talk about me today. That's what we're going to talk about. Me. So I want to talk about um, how I failed and how I turned that around. So those of you that uh, know my story, this will be uh, uh, a little uh, revamp, but just very briefly. First eight years in the business, never made more than fifty thousand dollars, and that was uh, started with a mayor prize, or we called ourselves IDS back then. Um, went to a bank, went to a you know, but they took all of my. Uh, <laughs> it was like an eighty twenty split, so I still only netted. It was pretty successful there, but I only netted fifty thousand dollars. Went independent, only made fifty thousand dollars. I mean, I was for eight years made fifty thousand dollars, and then well, basically overnight went up to uh, three fifty six. Was a seven fold increase. <laughs> After eight years of making no more than fifty thousand a year, jumping up sevenfold in one year. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, incredible. Then I went up another two times from three fifty six to six sixty seven, then to nine sixty seven, and then. As those of you are, uh, are aware of, uh, of Rochester, it's a town of 100,000 people surrounded by an hour and a half of farmland in every direction. So uh, now it does have the Mayo Clinic there, but uh, those of you that know me, how many of my clients were doctors? Let's see an answer to that. How many of my clients were doctors? Nobody. Zero. Yep, zero. I had one. So my clients were uh, teachers, IBM engineers. And nurses. That's it. So I made this kind of money with normal people, not huge tickets. So what caused me? What happened here? Lots of things happened here at this eighth year. But I mean, I mean the, that uh, to to this was a uh, skyrocketing after eight years. So what changed? I want to talk about that today. So habits of unsuccessful people, look at all these uh, balloons, act before they think, think they know it all, try to bring others down to their level, stop learning, think and say and do negative things, blame others, talk more than they listen, fear change, hoard in, uh, information and data, give up easily, waste time, criticize, never uh, set goals. You know, well, now that's the one, I, do, I don't like goals, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, take the easy way out. Secretly hope others fail. Want uh, don't <laughs> know what they want to be. Always angry at others. Hold a grudge. Have a sense of entitlement. And guess what? This this slide encapsulated. This slide encapsulated the first eight years in my in, in the business. It encapsulated the first eight years. I had all of these bad, unsuccessful habits. So I'm just let's just walk through. Don't know what they want to be. So here's what I want you to think. When you don't know what you want to be, how much effort did I put towards anything? If I didn't know what I wanted to be, how much effort did I put towards anything? You know, if I, well, you know that the um, well, think, let's think about this. The um, U.S. Uh, uh, women's soccer team won the World Cup yesterday. What did those uh, uh, women know for their basically their entire adult lives? What did they know? Did they know what they want to be, or were they just like, hmm, I wonder what I want? They had one. <laughs> they knew what they wanted to be, the number one team. They wanted to be the best at uh, in the world at soccer. So how much effort did they put into it? How much effort did they put in? When they knew what they wanted to be, how much effort did they put into it? Did they let anything get in their way? Did they let injuries get in their way? Did they let um, divorces get in their way? Did they let um, taking their daughter to a dance class get in the way? Now, they all have families. They all, a lot of them are, <laughs> some of them have problems, but a lot of them are very happily married and have families. But they didn't let that get in the way. They, they were able to manage both. So when I didn't know what I wanted to be, I mean, all I knew was vaguely I wanted to make a living. I, w I wanted to make a living as a financial advisor. Would you classify wanting to make a living as a financial advisor knowing what I want to be? Would you classify that as knowing what I want to be? No. It's like I fell into it. I said, well, you know, it's, uh, I guess this is as good as any other way to make a living, so I guess I might as well try to make a living doing this. Well, if that's the way I approach my job, guess guess the, what kind of energy, focus, um, 
work ethic I'm going to put into it if all I'm looking at is a way to make a living. So I understand uh, there's a lot of different mentalities, a lot of different theories out there about, you know, you shouldn't live for your job. You should live, you know, your job should should uh, uh, allow you to live your life. Hey, I get it. But, you know, if, if you got to do one or the other. But when you, when you muddle through life and you muddle through your job, guess what you're doing? If you're if you if you're if I was just working to make a living so that I could really just live, but I, do you think I really <laughs> when I was making that fifty thousand dollars a year, do you think I had some sort of goal outside of uh of of work that I wanted to be? I knew what I wanted to be outside of work, so the only reason I was a financial advisor was so I could make a living, so I could become an Olympic high jumper, or did I really have no idea what I wanted to do or want to be outside of the job either. Yeah, so that's it, Kevin. Settling for mediocrity. So all I was doing was using financial, you know, being a financial advisor to make a living so I could live. But there was no, yeah, sure, I wanted to be a good husband, a good dad, I, but, but, but there was no, I didn't know what I wanted. Did I want to be the world's best dad? Well, I guess you could say that, but did I put all that much effort into that? I, I, I hope I put effort into being a dad, but but was I like taking dad classes and and doing all? I mean, uh, spending time mapping out how I was going to be the best dad in the world. No, I wasn't. What I was doing is what was was I focused? Did I know what I want to be at work? Did I not want to be away from work? Or was I just rolling through life, just settling? Right, Roy, just settling. Just, as Kevin said, just uh, settling for mediocrity. So you need to know what you want to be. Or guess what you're going to do? You're going to wake up every day, and the next day you're going to be what? If you don't know what you want to be, guess what to, What you're going to be tomorrow? If you don't know what you want to be, guess what you're going to be tomorrow? The same thing. Same place. Exactly. This is the same exact thing. And if that's what you want, that's great. But boy, to live, you know, we were all given the gift of life. And we only have so much time on earth. And there's no time better than right now. You're healthy. You're, you're healthy. You're as young as you're ever going to be. You've got more time than you're ever going to have for the rest of your life right now. Decide what you want to be. I don't care if it's done. If you don't want to uh, uh, be a great financial advisor, then figure out what you want to be outside of work and let what you make here allow you to do that. If you don't know what you want to do outside of work, then be a great advisor. I've just chosen to be this is my life. I like what I do now. I, I like the science, the psychology of, of, of help getting people to do the things they need to do to help themselves. I, I love that. I know what I want to be now, and that's why I'm successful now. I get up every day, and I'm, I'm eager to, 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 to get better at what I do. I read books. I'm coming, I mean, I probably go through, right now I have five books I'm in the middle of. So those are the kind of, I mean, when I was just muddling through making 50 grand a year, Guess what kind of books I read? Guess how many books I was reading at all? How much time was I on the boob tube versus reading? But once you know what you want to be, you start to get better. You start at, every, at everything in life, okay? Sense of entitlement. Sense of entitlement. So here's how that, that affected me. Sense of entitlement was that I couldn't figure out why people didn't want to work with me. If they came to my office, obviously they didn't want to help, and I'm sitting there helping them. If I do all the work, they should work with me. Gosh darn it. I mean, I was entitled. I was entitled to their business. What's wrong with that, guys? If I feel like I'm entitled to their business, I mean, am I entitled to anybody's business? Am I entitled to anybody's business? Do they owe me a single thing? What if I do a ton of work for them? Do they owe it to me to work with me? If I do a ton of work for them, do, I, do they owe it to me to work with them? No, I, I must earn it. Right, Roy? But when I had this sense of entitlement, when it didn't work out, guess whose fault it was? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, I thought I knew it all. I knew it all. I, you know, the thing is, I went and got my CFP. I, I, I read all the, the books on, uh, on investment management. I mean, probably a good 30 or 40 different books on investment management. I had 
uh, purchased probably um, five or six money management courses. I was a genius. I knew it all. <laughs> and the funny thing is when I listened to the tapes, at the end of that eighth year, when I started to listen to myself on tapes, guess what? I did know it all. I was a frigging genius. And what did that get me? What did being a, a genius get me? None. Got me people who did not want to work with me. So what did I change? Well, let me go back here. So what did I change here? When I didn't know what I wanted to be, what did I change finally? Focus, right, Jim? I knew, I, I knew what I wanted to be. Right, Michael? Sense of entitlement, what did I change here? What I just, yeah, my attitude. What, what attitude did I change? Jim, what attitude did I change? Yeah, nobody owes me anything, Chris. Exactly right. Nobody owes me anything. That's exactly what I changed, Chris. And that was a huge uh, change uh, to me. So think they know it all. So here's the thing. <laughs> what did being a CFP, what did re reading all those, becoming, becoming a genius on investment management, what did all those things get me? And showing people that I knew all that stuff, what did that get me? Nothing. So what did I change here? And somebody said it earlier when I first asked this question. Bert said it. Motivational interviewing and gots. I went from telling them all I knew to what? Having them tell me. So I went from being the know-it-all to allowing them to be the know-it-all. Holy moly, when I changed that, the skies open up, the sun started shining, and yet what is every advisor out there in pursuit of? Why, did, why is every advisor out there um, looking for the best money management? Because they think what? There's some way that they can know it all. How about the, uh, you know, they're looking for software. They're looking for all, uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 all sorts of things so they can show people how much they know. What does that get you guys? Because do people move to you because of how much you know? Do people move to you? Will people ever move to you because of how much you know? That's right, Rick. They will not. They will never look for you because of how much you know. Do they really think that any of us know more than anybody else? Do they really think any advisor knows more than another one? Right, Michael, they don't. Why? The same way I don't think a doctor, if I go to a doctor, I'm not wondering how much he knows. I'm assuming if he's a doctor... He can practice medicine. When I'm going to a mechanic, I don't wonder if he can fix my if he's smarter than the mechanic across the street. I know that if he's a mechanic, he can fix my car. What am I worried about? What am I worried about? Trust, honesty, exactly. So when I quit trying to know it all and instead let the client know it, let the client take credit for all the ideas, let the credit the client figure out things for themselves. Holy moly, the the, the world open up. So that's, I, I started to use motivational interviewing. I started to use GOTS. Fear change. So I didn't want to change anything. I didn't want to change anything. Why? Because if I change things, if I try to do things differently, what would happen? Well, that, you know, this here's the sad thing. The sad thing about uh, fearing change is that if you don't change, you're going to get what? Yeah, the same thing. And, and, and when it comes down to what I really think that I was afraid of is the fear of change from working versus not working. <laughs> because uh, I would tell myself seeing three people in a week, boy, that's a, that's a full week. How can I see more than that? I mean, how could I how could I possibly see 30 people in a week? That would be crazy. That's cray cray talk. So I my my major fear at least was was not <laughs> was not uh, uh, getting more busy. I think because I thought if I got so busy, I don't know what I would do, and I'd be over I'd be over my head. So you you can't fear change. Now there, on the other side of this. There's some people that, that the reason they uh, are unsuccessful, and I, I was a victim of this as well, it wasn't a fear of change, it was what? 
embracing change. What do I mean by that? Another reason I failed, and a lot of guys I see uh, 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 um, fail, is because they embrace change. But what's the problem with their embracing of change? Ah, Chris, you're right. Constant change, not sticking with any particular thing. So any of you out there that are uh, the golf, when you first make a change in your stroke, what's going to happen to your game? It's going to just collapse because it takes a while for you to work through integrating that. So if instead, if you're constantly changing your stroke and changing your stroke, changing your stroke, guess what's going to happen? Nothing. Because anything that you change, will it work for you instantly? Any great change, will it work for you instantly? Change in your diet, will that work instantly, make you lose weight and get healthy? Uh, change in um, working out, will that change your health instantly? Is there any great change that will happen instantly, or does it take time? It takes time. So the other, on the opposite side of this, and I think this, this was actually worse for me, was I was constantly changing and never actually mastering anything. Just change, 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 never mastering anything. If you never master anything, guess what? Again, that, it's that word I think Kevin used earlier. If I don't stick to something long enough to master it, what's going to happen? I'm going to be living in a, in a state of constant what? What, guys? Mm, flux, yeah. Mediocrity is what I'm looking for. That's right, Kevin, mediocrity. I never really get good at anything. And here's the thing. You can be horrible at something. I'm, I'm sorry, not horrible at something. You can pick something that's not all that great but be awesome at it, and guess what happens? When I wrestled, I was not, <laughs> I was not that uh, great a wrestler, but I knew one move. And you know what? I, I, I took on the top wrestler in the state of Minnesota with that move, and there was, he, knew I, he knew I knew the move. I knew it, I was going to do the move on him, and he could do nothing about it, just because I, I was that, I knew that move better than, than anything out there. Now, he killed me after that, but there was nothing to do with that particular move. You need to, you need to when you finally uh, find something that's working, master it. Master it, master it, master it. And, and um, so fearing change is one thing, but embracing change to the point where you're changing constantly is another thing. And I quit doing both those things. What I did is if I... If so, here's when I know what 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 happens now when I know I need to change. What happens now? What what is a clue for me that I need to change? Yeah, it's not working, Jerry. That's right. It's just it's not, Jerry is it stops working. Once it stops working, I know I need to change. But if it is working, guess what? I keep doing. I keep doing the same thing over and over and over if it's working. Okay. Stop learning. Again, this is kind of a double-edged sword. I kept learning, learning, learning. What was I learning, guys? What kind of things did I keep learning? Because I did keep learning, even when I was making 50, the wrong stuff, Gary. Exactly, the wrong stuff. What stuff was I learning? Aha, Kevin, the technical things, the things that I thought... I could figure out how to beat the market. That's what I was trying to learn. How can I beat the market? Guys, can I beat the market? Can anybody beat the market? No. If we could beat the market, we wouldn't certainly tell anybody we could beat the market. We'd be living on our yachts in the Bahamas. But that's what I was trying to learn. And what was I not learning? What was I not learning? How do we make a living in our business? Ah, people, Dale. How to listen, sales. Let's face it. I mean, you can be the. I know guys who are very, very good um, at analysis. Guys who are very good at financial planning. And guess what they are right now? Do they own their own businesses? Or are they pair planners? Yeah, they're broke, Kevin. They're pair planners. They work for other people. They work for other people. Why? And we all know that that doe head across town, right? That doe head across town who, who knows nothing. He puts everybody into the same mutual funds over and over. He doesn't care if they're 20 years old or 90 years old. doesn't care if they're a business person or a doctor. Everybody's in the exact same mutual funds, and he is successful as heck. Why? Because he's what? 
good with people. See, what I stop learning is how to deal with people. I stop learning how to deal with people. Instead, I learned how to argue with people. I learned how to prove how people were wrong and I was right. I learned, and again, was I do, when I was proving to people that they were wrong and I was right, was I doing it to belittle them? Was I doing it to belittle them? No, I was doing them to what? To help them. I tried to say, that's right, Tony. I tried to say, folks, you're not doing the right thing. I know how to do the right thing. Let me help you. Is that how they took it? Boy, listening to the tapes, that was, I certainly wouldn't have taken it that way if I was on the receiving end of that. So I stopped learning the most important skill that we need. Guys, if you want to be in analysis, should you be doing what you're doing right now? If you want to be uh, a great f uh, financial money manager, should you be dealing with people? Do great money managers deal with people, right, Michael? No. They what? They work in the back office and just manage the money. But if you do what we do, we hire people to manage money, so our job is to manage what? Relationships. That's right, Michael, relationships. So we, I had stopped learning how to manage relationships. And what did I do? How did I change that around? How did I turn that around, guys? What did I do to change that? I adopted what? GOTS, exactly. GOTS, recording, and motivational interviewing. And when I did that, when I learned how to communicate better with people, guess what magically happened to my business? When I quit trying to figure out how to beat the market, instead learned how to learned how to beat myself, learned how to communicate better. When I quit trying to beat the market, trying to get smarter than the market, instead started to get smarter about how to deal with people, my income took off. Does that make sense? Now, this, I was horrible with this. I still have to control this on a daily basis. And those of you that have read um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, the first cardinal rule in that book is do not condemn, complain, or something else. Condemn, complain, or I can't remember. Condemn, but basically, quit the negative talk. Criticize. Think. Criticize, condemn, or complain. Criticize, condemn, or complain. You've got to stop criticizing, condemning, or complaining. Quit saying and thinking negative things. If you say negative and, and, and think negative things, guess what you're going to get? Oh, I would agree, Kevin. Crap. You're gonna, if you think, say negative things, you get negativity. Right, Rick? You get what you're doing. You get it right back at you. Why do I get – so you know what I quit doing? I quit calling people plate lickers. Is play liquors a positive thing or a negative thing, guys? I quit saying, oh, these people are just coming to eat off me. Oh, these people are, these people have no money. Oh, these people are just going to blah, 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 blah. When I quit doing that, it's amazing. The same people were coming to my events. The same exact people were coming to my events, but when I quit saying that stuff, guess what magically happened? The same people, I was mailing to the exact same people, but when I quit saying and thinking negative things about them, guess what magically happened? Yeah, Tony, they became better people. Isn't that amazing? Same mailing, but when I quit thinking about that, uh, negative things, criticizing, condemning, and complaining, all of a sudden these people became better people. Really? It seemed so, because I was treating them differently, so they were acting differently. So do you understand why I, I get irritated when somebody says, oh, these people were plate lickers. Oh, these people were here just to use me. Oh, these people were all poor. Oh, these were the wrong kind of people. Do you get why I have a conniption when you say those kind of things? Because I used to say those things myself. And what did it get me? So I'm trying to beat it out of you because I'm trying to have you learn from my bad lessons. When I thought and said negative things, that's what I got. When I instead approached the world with the sunshine on my face, a big smile on my face, and everybody was great people, guess what just ha happened to happen? I just ran into lots of great people. Don't prejudge people. Don't condemn people. Don't say things bad about them. I did that. I still have a problem with that, and I fight that every single day. Because I find that when I get into that rut, guess what happens? I get what I, <laughs> what I talk about. 
So I want to be talking about good people and good things, not bad people and bad things. Does that make sense to you guys? Or, or am I, I, I know it sounds New Ages, but uh, guys, it's not New Ages. It is science. If you treat people, if, if you think negative things about people, can you really treat them that well? Or can most people sense it? Can they see through it? Yeah, focus on the positive, Kevin. Secretly hope others fail. <laughs> Boy, I, I, we just talked about that guy across town who was a complete doughhead, you know, putting everybody in the same funds. And I'm sitting there, I'm a CFP, and I'm creating, I'm creating financial plans that should be in the Smithsonian. They're so beautiful. And, and, and this guy is making money. He doesn't know what the heck he's doing. So all, instead of worrying about me, guess what I wanted? Guess where I spent all my mental energy, all my dreaming, all my focus? Where, where do you think I was spending it? Wishing bad things on that guy. It wasn't about, you know, it, my whole life became about all those other people who were successful who I didn't think were as good as me. Oh, great, now I'm back to what? Saying negative and thinking negative things. Oh, these people aren't as good as me, and, and they're better than me. So, I, you know, they're going to get their own. They must be doing something wrong, blah, 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 right? So I spent all my time worrying about other people when I should have been worrying about who? Who should I have been worried about? So when I, what did I change to fix this? Yeah. So how did I change myself? Guys, when I was making a million dollars a year in here in Rochester, do you think I had a clue what any other advisor in town was doing? No clue. That's right, Michael. I had no clue on what any other advisor was doing in town. Now, when I was making 50 grand a year, guess how much I knew about what every other advisor in town was doing? Yeah, I knew everything, man. I knew all the gossip, all who was in trouble, who was doing this, who was doing that. When I was making 50 grand a year, I knew all that stuff. But when I when I started being successful, I, I became successful because I didn't care what anybody else was doing. Do I have any control about other somebody else's success or somebody else's failure? The only person I have control over is my own. So when I started to put all my energy towards my own success or, or prevention of failure, guess what magically happened? I started to get more successful. Ah, talk more than I listen. So when I listened to my tapes, when I started to listen to my tapes, and again, that was a huge change that year that I went from making uh, 50000 up to 356 I started to tape and listen to, I listened to a half an hour of tape every single day, five days a week. That's how I ended my day, half, a, half an hour of listening to my tape. Did I have anybody critique it for me, guys? Did I have any system to, to uh, 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 compare it to? Or did it, no. But even so, just listening to my own tape a half an hour a day, Guess what that allowed me to be tomorrow? Listening to my, a tape of myself, ending my day with an half an hour tape of me listening to myself, what did that allow me to do tomorrow? That's right, Sean. It allowed me to be better. Right, Bert? A little bit better. And guess what I got a lot better at? This slide right here, what do you think I got a lot better at? Got Yeah, I did. Yep. Listening. That's right. Shutting up. I got better at shutting up and letting them talk. And obviously, motivational interviewing helped a lot um, with that. This kind of goes back to hoarding information and data. So guess what? I, when I was making 50 grand a year, like I said, how many books did I read on investment management? How many uh, money management um, um, uh, uh, systems did I buy? How many magazine articles did I read about? I was constantly what? Hoarding information. What did that do for me, guys? What did that do? Hoarding all that information. Because think about it. What are your clients doing right now? What is the population doing right now? Same thing, right? They're gathering all this information, and what is that information worth to them? And it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. Why is hoarding information and data dangerous, guys? Confusion, I'd agree with that. Why else? Info overload, I'd agree with that. Fear, yeah. My, my belief is information, uh, well, I agree with that. Uh, my feeling is that it, it allows me to think 
Yeah, it takes up time, Roy. Holy moly, it takes up time. There's no action, right, Bert? So my feeling is that hoarding information gives us the feeling that we're in what? We have all this information. It gives us the feeling that we're what? Working? Yeah, I'd agree with that. What else? In control, Jim. That's it. In control. It gives us the feeling that we're in control. If I have all this information, I obviously can beat what? If I have all this information, I can obviously beat what? The others, the market, etc. Guys, there's tons of science based on this. There's tons of research that's been done on this. That when I research something, I automatically begin to think, what about myself? When I start to research something, I automatically begin to think, what about myself? That I'm smart, exactly, Bert. That I'm smarter, exactly. So when I quit doing this, so guess when I did all my research, guys? I did research only about uh, uh, once. Now, I do research all the time because that's what you guys hire me to do now. But when I, was, when I was in production, when I was making a million a year in this little town, town of Rochester, how much time did I spend on research and information? About a month a, a year. And guess what month I took to do that? Yeah, I took, well, I, you know what, July and December, both of those are right. I would spend uh, time in July and December, so probably, uh, uh, if you combine them, about two weeks in July, two weeks in December, that's when I did all my research. That's when I did all my research on what, what products I was going to sell. And you could, t you could talk to the, uh, my, my FMO at that point, guess how much uh, time in, uh, uh, in my money management, I, I spent no time looking for new products. I found those products... Uh, during the rest of the year. I, I, I researched products in July and I researched products in December. And then guess what I sold between J July and December and December and July? Those products. Same thing. And guess what? What did that, <laughs> when I started to do that, what did that allow me to do? See more people, focus, all those things. Absolutely. It allowed me to quit what? <laughs> She allowed me to quit wasting time. Because, guys, here's the thing. I worked an eight-hour day. When I was making 50 grand a year, I worked an eight-hour day. What did I do during that eight hours? What did I do during that eight hours? Now, my wife has a doc at the Mayo Clinic. Yeah, I putzed around, Kevin. Exactly. Shuffle paper. Right, Roy? Research, uh, Roy. Yeah, exactly. shuffle paper, Tony. So... You know, and, and you know what? Uh, my wife is a doctor of the Mayo Clinic, so if anything in the household needed to be done, guess what I did? I volunteered because then it made me feel like I was what? Busy. And here's the sad thing. I was always the first one in to work and the last one out of work. And many of those guys were making far more money than I was. But it made me feel like I was what? Productive. You gotta, uh, when I quit wasting time, that's when I started to really, uh, uh, and we're going to talk about that here in a couple of slides. That's when I really started to take off. I got distracted every day. What kind of things, what's the biggest distraction we have, guys? What's the biggest distraction we all have? The Internet, computer, newspapers. For me, it was newspapers because there wasn't the Internet back then yet, or not much, or it was so dang slow. So, but email is your biggest distraction by far. So here's the thing. You get an email from an FMO about a new marketing system. Guess what you do? Oh, my God. I got it. That sounds awesome. I better check that out. So how many of the rules of, of unsuccessful would we, being unsuccessful would we be uh, uh, breaking if we did that? When we see an email, we see a, uh, uh, a, a new marketing system. How many of those would we be yeah, a bunch, Kevin, exactly? But guys do it every single day. Now here's the thing. Here's the what. I, uh, so <clears throat> what, you gotta be focused. If you get distracted before, here's what. Here's when you should get. To, remember what we said. When should you make change? When should you make change? We talked about it here a few minutes ago. Only when it's needed. Which how do we know when it's needed? When what we're doing isn't working. So I. When I started to just say, you know what, I'm going to just do this one thing, ignore everything else, do this one thing, master it, and if after I master it, it's not working, 
then I'll look for something else. In July, I'll look for something. In December, I'll look for something. But between July and December, guess what? I'm not looking for anything. I'm going to be hammering and being the best I can at what I can be during those months. Then I can evaluate in December what happened through the fall, or then I can evaluate in July what happened during the, the, the winter and spring. But I'm not looking, I wasn't looking for anything during those months because I was busy what? Getting better at what I do. I quit getting distracted. So how should you handle emails, guys? How should you handle email? What is it? Every expert, every expert out there will tell you this is how you handle email. How do you handle it? That's right. Read it two times a day. That's it. That's all. You don't need, you know what? You don't need to read it any more than two times a day. <clears throat> read it and get busy doing stuff that you should be doing. Making sense? So here's, when I talk to guys and I'll ask them, um, you know, They'll, t they'll come with all sorts of excuses why they haven't accomplished a task they were supposed to do. The, uh, whether it's a memorize a script or or make an appointment with a client or what you know, not huge things, guys. We're talking about memorize a script or make an appointment with a client, and they'll come up with all sorts of reasons why they couldn't do it. So, guys, here's the thing. I mean, I run. This is my calendar. I run between 36 and 42 appointments a week. 36 to 42 appointments a week. I used to think running, th getting three, <laughs> a one new new prospect appointment and two client uh, annual reviews, that was a busy week. I now run 36. That's over 10 times more appointments. Over 10 times more appointments, and I still have time to write a uh, a, a a coaching call PowerPoint that's an hour long every week, and prepare for a coaching call on Friday and write letters for guys and help them uh, figure out what they're doing in, in their particular marketing plans. And I have time to do all that and have 36 to 42 appointments a week. So guys, when you tell me you weren't able to make an appointment with a client or you tell me that you weren't able to memorize a script, what do you think I do? What do you think I do when you say something like that? That's right, Kevin. I laughed my ass off. And here's what I do. I say, you know what? Why don't you give me your calendar? Why don't you give me your calendar? And if you guys, here's the thing. If everybody on this call right now gave me their calendar, guess how much everybody on this system would be making within six months? If you gave me your calendar, guess what everybody in the system would be making? It's, it's amazing. It's amazing when I talk to guys and they'll say, well, I'm getting a divorce. So can I ask you a question, guys? Um, do doctors then take off for three or four months when they're getting a divorce? Do uh, garbage collectors take off three or four months when they're getting a divorce? Does the uh, clerk at, uh, the, at, the, at the convenience store take off three or four months? Does the teacher take three or four months off when they're getting a divorce? How about, um, wh how about when uh, you know, I, or I have guys on this system who have spouses that are ill, severely ill, but guess what they still do? They work hard. These are successful guys. They're working hard for their spouse that's ill. But I have other guys that will tell me, you know, I have a foot problem, and so I'm taking it two or three months off. Not everybody, but I'm telling you that I, I hear that this so often that it, it drives me bananas. Because you work in an industry, where you can be a lazy cuss and still make seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, guys. I could go out in a month, write three million dollars, and I made what, hundred eighty thousand dollars, and take the rest of the year off. How many jobs are there out there like that? So I could be. I mean, we can be lazy in this job and still make it more than what the average person in this industry does. So what you need to think about, and again. Decide how many hours you want to work a week. Decide how many hours you want to work a week, uh, and each day, and then work during that time. So if you're going to work four hours, then then that's cool. But then work those four hours, and then be able to 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 say to your wife, "Here's what I did during these four hours," or be willing to say to Mike, to Mike, to me, say, "You know what? Here's what I did for those four hours." And are you going to be embarrassed or not? You don't need, if you don't want to work eight hours, don't work eight hours. But certainly, 
Don't work four hours and spread it out over eight hours. Geez, go to the gym, go golfing, read, uh, learn to play the piano, spend time with your family. But when you're working, what should you be doing? Work. And please, 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 please do not tell me that you don't have time to do things. That's what I used to say. So how did I fix that, guys? How did I fix this whiny-ass behavior that I had of always saying that I was too busy, it was too hard, I can't, don't have time? What did I do? The hint. The hint is on the screen. What did I do? Ah, Chris, I scheduled everything. I scheduled my day. So if I had a blank spot in my day, what did I schedule there? Take an extra time for lunch, take an extra time for the gym, take an extra time to read news. What did I skip? Practice, exactly, Bert. Tape review, practice, tape review, practice. It was, mag it was magical. When I would schedule tape review and practice, guess what happened to my <laughs> guess what happened to my empty slots in my calendar? When I was constantly practicing and constantly tape reviewing, guess what happened to the empty spots in my calendar? They filled, exactly. They filled with appointments. So guys, here's the thing. In, at this point in my life, do I really need to be running 36 to 42 appointments with you guys? Do you really think I need to be doing this? So why do I do this then? So why do I do that? Yeah, I, I, I would say I have a passion. I would not say that I love it. Missy, can you get on the phone here a second? I'm on. <laughs> would you say that I love having 32 to 40, uh, uh, 36 to 42 appointments uh, coaching guys every single? No, no. Unfortunately, you do not love it. So I do it because I have a passion for helping you guys. I do it because I, if I don't do it, guess how good you guys are going to get. Guess how easy it will be for you guys to fall off the wagon. Guess how easy it will be for you guys just to not get any better. Guys, I don't do it because it's freaking fun. I do it because if I want you guys to get better, I have to do things that I want to do or that I have to do. Things that I enjoy or things that I have to do. So if, I, if I'm doing this to help you and then you tell me you don't have time to do something, do you think I, I just say, oh, yeah, I can understand how you're so busy. Do you think that's what I'm thinking? I'm not doing oh, And then, Missy, go ahead and mute yourself. I can still hear you. So, so guys, I'm not doing this because I, I, I love to do it. I'm doing it because I love you guys. I do it, I'm doing it because I love the fact that you guys are committed to getting better, to being part of the solution of this industry instead of the problem with this industry. So I have a passion for, for helping you get better at helping clients. That's what I have a passion for. It's not because I love coaching you guys. I mean, it's, it's brutal to be having eight appointments every single day with you guys talking about the same things over and over with everybody. But if I believe in what we're doing, guess what I have to do, guys? If I believe in what we're doing, guess what I have to do? I have to do it. I have to hammer it. I have to lead. I have to do it. So th that's what I do. So guys, please don't tell me that you're too busy because, because when you say you're too busy, I'm going to ask for your calendar. And then we'll see about getting you busy, okay? <laughs> oh, give up easily? Heck yeah, I gave up easily. Gave up easily. I mean, it's always the easy way. I was too, you know, I always taking the easy way out. Taking the easy way out. What's the easy way out most times, guys? What's the easy way out most times? Settling. I agree with that. Settling. Yep. Aha! Excuses. Blaming others. That's the that's the big thing that I did. I blamed others. It's not my fault. It's the economy. It's the regulators. It's the interest rates. It's the insurance companies. It's the money management companies. It's uh, my competitors. It's the clients. It was always who? Somebody. It's the paperwork. Exactly, Roy. So it's always somebody else's fault. The number one thing that I changed, the number one thing that I changed when I went from making $50,000 a year for eight years to taking off, guess what the number one thing I changed? Everything else, everything else grew from this thing. What was my attitude change? I quit what? I quit blaming others. I started to say, you know what, if I'm not succeeding, there's only one person 
responsible for not succeeding. That's me. If I am succeeding, the only person responsible is me. I mean, that's a two-sided sword. I can, you know, I can also take full responsibility for succeeding, but I got to take responsibility. When I'm not succeeding, I need to take responsibility for that. I needed to have a plan to get better. The, the, the basic plan I started with was just taping my meetings, taping my meetings. And then I added motivational interviewing to, to help me fix those meetings. So let me ask you a question, guys. If you were given, um, if you were told that if you, you know, these hands on cars, if you hold your, put, leave your hand on the car for a certain period of time or the last person standing gets the car, what if I changed the rule and said, listen, and I want you all to answer this. If I said, hey, you can get this car. All you need to do, you're not even, you're not even playing against anybody else. All you need to do is take your hand and hold it on this car for 24 hours. If you just hold your hand on this car for 24 hours, I will give you this car. I want to see your answer to this. How many of you would take this? How many of you would do this? Even if you didn't want that car, what would you do? You'd do it just so you could what? Take the $150,000 car, sell it for $120,000, and pocket the money. So we would all do it, wouldn't we? Now how much effort does that take to do that? It takes some effort, doesn't it? it takes some effort. I mean, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be easy. You're going to be tired. You're going to be uh, bored. You're going to be... Uh, uh, it's not that easy, but is it doable? It's doable. How about if I told you if you walked for four hours a day for a month, I'd give you $200,000. Would you do that? Just for a month. If you walk for four hours a day for a month, would you do that? Walk whatever pace you want, fast, slow, whatever. I mean, I'm not talking about heavy lifting. I'm talking about just gentle walking down the street. For Would you do that? Yeah, most people would. What if I told you if you read Shakespeare for four hours a day? Now, I, uh, this would be boring as heck to me. I'm not a big Shakespeare fan, but if you told me uh, you would, uh, if I read Shakespeare for four hours a day, you give me two hundred thousand dollars. Guess what I'd do? Would you guys do it? How about if you, uh, if I just said, hey, write this over and over and over, four hours a day. I must not write on over our walls. I must not write on walls. I must not write on walls over and over every single every, every single day for a month, for four hours a day, for two hundred thousand dollars. Would you do that? Yeah. And the reason I bring this up is. Do you guys believe in 5Q that what we say we can do, we can do, that it actually works the way we say it works? Now, I know that a lot of you guys do because you're having unbelievable success with it, but do the rest of you? Because if you believe it, here's, here's what I'd ask you. I've been asking guys this for over a decade. If I grabbed a firefighter, now, does a firefighter know anything about financial planning, finances, or selling? Does he know anything about any of those things? And I told him, listen, if you learn the 5Q system, I'm going to give you two weeks to learn the 5Q system, just two weeks to learn the 5Q system, and I'll pay you $200,000, ask yourself, would this fireman know the 5Q system better than you or less than you? And I've been asking advisors this for a decade. Guess what? The only answer I've gotten from advisors, that he'd know it better. Now, why? Why would he know it better? Because you know what? When he came home, what would his wife say? His wife would lock him in the room, and would, it, would, he say, would she say, hey, honey, can you take the kids to dance tonight? Hey, honey, can you help me with it? Would she, what would the wife do during those two weeks? She would lock him in that room and shove food under the door and tell the kids what? Don't bother daddy for the next two weeks. And he would spend how much time in those next two weeks learning the 5Q system? So the question I have again is, do you believe in the 5Q system? If you believe in the 5Q system, why wouldn't you do what the fireman's doing? Why wouldn't you do that? See, your beliefs don't make you a better person. Your behavior does. If you believe in it, then you need to what, guys? Act on it. See, if you believe that we can get you in front of an average of 34 buying units a month, if you believe that we can get 80 to 100 percent appointments, see we got guys every single month getting in front of this many people. We got guys getting half of the guys that are doing these things are getting 80 to 100 percent appointment ratios. Now the other half are not. So what do the other half have to do, guys? If you're not part of that half getting 80 to 100 percent appointments, you should be better what? 
Because if half of them are doing it, we know that it works. So you can't tell me it doesn't work. And even the guys that don't get half, they, do they ever tell me it doesn't work, or what do they tell me? I didn't learn it well enough. I didn't practice it enough. Learn it then. And you get, if you get 90% of people to give you all the, to move all their money to you, guys, this is what 5Q does for you. How much money would you make with using the big three, with the outside the box, with GOTS? With understanding that any point worth making should be made by them. $200,000? No. You're we're not, it's $200,000 is what? Guys, I've had over 13 guys, no, no, oh, actually not over, I've had 13 guys who were all making less than 200000 when they came to me make over a million dollars a year within 18 months. So it's not, $200,000 is, is, is peanuts with what you'll make. And it's every single year after this. I've had 400 guys double their income. So if you haven't doubled your income yet, what's that tell you? If you have not doubled your income yet, what's that tell you? Double is the low end. The average person triples their income within two years on the 5Q system. So if you haven't doubled your income yet, you better think about that fireman and think, do I really want this or not? Do I really believe in this or not? So I'm not asking you to do this unless you believe in it. But if you believe in it, then do what should you do, guys? If you believe in it, you should what? You got, you got to do it. So what is the solution? Do you have to do it overnight? You don't have to do it overnight. Look at this is an amazing thing. If you just get 2% better, just 2% better every week, how hard is it? How would you get to, let me ask you a question. How would you get 2% better every week, guys? Tape reviews, Tony. That's one way. Listen to tapes. How else? Scheduling practice, yep, learning scripts, all those things. Do you really think if you were doing tape reviews, listening to tapes on these coaching calls and actually implementing the things we talk about coaching calls, not just listen to them, but implementing these things, learning the scripts, not just the big three, but all the scripts, if you were doing that, would you get just 2% better a week or would you get more than that? I would agree with that, Steve. You're saying a half a percent a day, which would be about 5% a week. If you did those things, you'd just get a tiny bit better. And look, at by the end of the... Uh, 52 weeks, you're at 270%, 275% better. Guys, that is cray -cate. In real money, this is what we're talking about. You start out at 200,000. At 100,000, you'd be at, at there's your 2% better. And, and this is our average. Our average guy over two years uh, goes up 300%, or goes up 300%, triples their income. When I say over two years of over 18 months, triples their income. That's what the average guy has done over the last 15 years. So if you're not on track to triple your income from a, in your first year or first 18 months with us, then what does that tell you about your behavior? What does that tell you about your uh, belief system? What does that tell you about your ability to, to make the changes you need to make? So I'll be straight with you guys. I was the worst offender for eight years. I was the worst offender of all these things. That's why I struggled making 50 grand a year over and over and over. That's almost a decade, almost a decade <laughs> of making 50 grand a year. Not even, not even uh, increases for inflation. So I am the worst. All I'm telling you is you can either learn from my mistakes or not. But if you're not getting a little bit better every week, there's only one reason that's not happening. What's that reason, guys? Yeah, I agree. The focus is not where it should be. Yeah, it's you. You, you, you. Because you all gave me the right answers. Review your tapes. Guys, what if you only had one tape over the last month? How many times could you review that tape? What if you only had... Well, Mike, I don't have any tapes to review myself. I've only met one client in the last month. Well, what could you do? Guys, you don't review the whole tape. You review 10 minutes of it and, and, and fine-tune it so that, that you, you couldn't make a mistake over that next 10 minutes, the next time you have a client like that. So don't tell me you don't. If, you, if you're wondering how you can get better, call Jeff, call myself. We'll, give, we'll get you on a program to get better, but you guys already know how to do it. You either do tape reviews of yourself you implement the stuff that we talk on these coaching calls. You learn the scripts. You practice the scripts. If you do those things, getting 2% better a week is, is silly. You'll be getting a lot more than 2% better a week. 
Because the advantage is, guys, those of you who have done tape reviews, and some of you are very religious on tape reviews, so let me just, the guys that have done tape reviews with me, let me see your, your answer to this. Are you better the next time you do a meeting after you do a tape review? Yeah, so they're all saying absolutely yes. And that's the way, if you want to get better quickly, that's how you do it. So, guys, I'm, I'm not yelling at you. I'm saying, listen, this is the problems I had. All those problems being unsuccessful are the very problems that I had, and I overcame them. I overcame them within a year. You have the ability to overcome them in a year as well. But there's only one <laughs> person who can overcome them. It's you. So I hope you felt that this was a worthwhile call, and please just just don't let it go in. And for those of you that are not interested in this stuff we talked about, let it go in one ear and out the other. Those that are interested in this, hit a chord with. Don't just get excited for 15 minutes. Get excited for life. Watch this call once a week until you're doing what you need to do to 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 make this kind of money guys this is the average this is not the top guy this is the average guy you don't want to be below average not, i don't know a single guy on this call that wants to be below average or you wouldn't be on this call so i love you guys i work hard for you guys but i need you to work hard for yourself does that seem like a fair way to go forward guys super I appreciate all you guys and all that you do, and know that we're busting our butts for you here too, okay? So have a good rest of the week, and we'll talk to you all on Friday. Thanks, everybody.